Like all the other speakers, I want to thank the organizers for putting together this, I think, significant and very interesting program. Uh, I'm not sure that I will be able to successfully in a half hour indicate fully why I agree with Axel's critique and disagree with it fundamentally. Why rethink Marx? After all, the collapse of the Soviet Union and of European communism, as well as the transformation of China, have been taken by many as marking the final end of socialism and of Marx's theoretical relevance, the final act, as it were, of a decades-long demise. This demise has also been expressed by the emergence of other kinds of critical theoretical approaches, such as post-structuralism or deconstruction, that seem to offer the possibility of criticizing, for example, processes of rationalization and bureaucratization in both East and West without affirming the kinds of grand programs of human emancipation that all too frequently have had negative, even disastrous consequences. These newer conceptual approaches, however, have themselves been seriously called into question by the recent global crisis, which, as far as I'm concerned, has dramatically revealed their serious limitations as attempts to grasp the contemporary world. The continued eruption of serious economic, of severe economic crises as a feature of capitalist modernity, as well as the existence of mass poverty and structural exploitation on a global scale, suggest that reports of Marx's death have been greatly exaggerated. Nevertheless, it would be a mistake to think that one can simply return to Marx as he generally was understood, let's say, 50 years ago. Both the demise of traditional Marxism and the increasingly manifest inadequacies of much post-Marxism are rooted in historical developments that suggest the need to rethink as well as reappropriate Marx. Marx's critical theory is not, I would argue, on its most fundamental level, a critique of a determinate mode of class exploitation that distorts modernity, undertaken from a standpoint that affirms labor. Rather, more basically, it uncovers and analyzes a unique form of social mediation that structures modernity itself as a historically specific form of social life. This form of mediation is socially constituted by a historically unique form of labor and is essentially temporal. And hopefully I'll be able to get to the issue of temporality. It manifests itself in peculiar quasi-objective forms of domination that cannot sufficiently be understood in terms of the domination of a class or indeed of any concrete social and or political entity. These forms of domination, grasped by categories such as commodity and capital, are moreover not static and cannot adequately be conceptualized in terms of the market, but are expressed by a historical dynamic that is at the very heart of capitalist modernity. My focus on the historically dynamic character of capitalist society responds to the massive global transformations of the past four decades. This period has been characterized by the unraveling of the post-World War II state-centered Fordist synthesis in the West, the collapse or fundamental transformation of party states and their command economies in the East, and the emergence of a neoliberal capitalist global order, which might in turn be undermined by the development of huge competing economic blocks. These developments in turn can be understood with reference to the overarching trajectory of state-centric capitalism in the 20th century, 
from its beginnings in World War I and the Russian Revolution, through its high point in the decades following World War II, and its decline after the early 1970s. What's significant about this trajectory is its global character. It encompasses Western capitalist countries and the Soviet Union, as well as colonized lands and decolonized countries. Although differences in historical development occurred, of course, they appear, I would argue, more as different inflections of a common pattern than as fundamentally different developments. Contingency only has a certain play here. For example, the welfare state was expanded in all Western industrial countries in the 25 years after the end of World War II, and then limited or partially dismantled everywhere in the early, starting in the early 1970s. These developments, paralleled by the post-war success and subsequent rapid decline of the Soviet Union, occurred regardless of whether conservative or social democratic parties were in power. Such general developments cannot be explained in terms of contingent local political decisions. They imply the existence of a historical dynamic in both the East and the West that is not fully subject to political control and that expresses general systemic constraints on political, social, and economic decisions. Such historical transformations cannot adequately be grasped by theories of politics or of identity and they exceed the horizon of a social critique focused on distribution. They suggest the importance of a renewed encounter with Marx's critique of political economy, not his political economy, for the problematic of historical dynamic and global structural change is, I would argue, at the very heart of the critique. Nevertheless, the history of the last century also suggests that an adequate critical theory must differ fundamentally from traditional Marxist critiques of capitalism. I'm using the term traditional Marxism to refer to a general interpretive framework in which capitalism is analyzed essentially in terms of class relations rooted in private property relations and mediated by the market. Social domination is understood primarily in terms of class domination and exploitation. Within this general framework, capitalism is characterized by a growing structural contradiction between private property and the market, understood as society's basic social relations, and the forces of production interpreted in terms of labor. Within this framework, labor provides the standpoint of the critique of capitalism. Within the basic framework of what I'm calling traditional Marxism, there have been a very broad range of quite different theoretical, methodological, and political approaches which have generated powerful economic, political, social, historical, and cultural analyses. Nevertheless, the limitations of the overarching framework itself have become increasingly evident in light of 20th century historical developments. These developments include the non-emancipatory character of actually existing socialism, the historical trajectory of its rise and decline, the fact that it parallels that of state interventionist capitalism, suggesting that they were similarly located historically, the growing importance of scientific knowledge and advanced technology and production, which seem to call into question the labor theory of value. I'll come back to that. Growing criticisms of technological progress and growth, which oppose the productivism of much traditional Marxism, and the increased importance of non-class-based social identities. Together, they suggest that the traditional framework no longer can serve as an adequate point of departure for an emancipatory critical theory. Consideration of the general historical patterns that have characterized the past century then call into question both traditional Marxism with its affirmation of labor and history, 
as well as post-structuralist understandings of history as essentially contingent. Nevertheless, such consideration doesn't necessarily negate the critical insight informing attempts to deal with history contingently, namely, that history, understood as the unfolding of an imminent necessity, delineates a form of unfreedom. That form of unfreedom is the object of Marx's critique of political economy, which seeks to grasp the imperatives and constraints that underlie the historical dynamics and structural changes of the modern world. This critique, I argue, is not undertaken from the standpoint of history and of labor, as in traditional Marxism. On the contrary, the historical dynamic of capitalism, the totality, the seemingly ontological centrality of labor are the objects of Marx's critique. It should be evident that the critical thrust of Marx's analysis, according to this reading, is, in some, is similar in some respects to post-structuralist approaches inasmuch as it entails a critique of totality and of a dialectical logic of history. However, whereas Marx grasps those categories critically as expressions of the reality of capitalist society that hopefully point beyond itself, Post-structuralist approaches deny their existence by insisting on the ontological primacy of contingency. Seeking to expand the realm of freedom, such approaches end up denying or obscuring the dynamic form of domination grasped by the category of capital. Consequently, and ironically, these approaches are disempowering. Marx's mature theory then does not purport to be a transhistorically valid theory of history and social life. On the contrary, it is emphatically and reflexively historically specific. Indeed, it calls into question any approach that claims for itself universal transhistorical validity. In Marx's mature theory then, history, in English it would be with a capital H, understood as an imminently driven directional dynamic is not a universal feature of human life, neither, however, is historical contingency. Rather, an intrinsic historical dynamic is a historically specific feature of capitalist society that can be and has been projected onto human social life in general. Far from viewing history affirmatively, Marx, by grounding this directional dynamic in the category of capital, grasps it as a form of heteronomy. Reappropriating Marx's analysis, then, involves rethinking the most fundamental categories of his mature critique, such as value, commodity, surplus value, and capital, with reference to the heteronomous dynamic that characterizes capitalism. Within the traditional framework, Marx's category of value has been regarded as an attempt to show that direct human labor is the sole source, of, source of, human, of social wealth, which in capitalism is mediated by the market. His category of surplus value, according to such views, demonstrates the existence of exploitation in capitalism by showing that in spite of appearances, the surplus product in capitalism is not constituted by a number of factors, but by labor alone. This surplus is appropriated by the capitalist class. Surplus value within the traditional framework is a category of class-based exploitation. This interpretation is based on a transhistorical understanding of labor as an activity mediating humans and nature that transforms matter in a goal-directed manner and is a condition of social life. Labor, so understood, is posited as the source of wealth in all societies and is that which constitutes what is universal and truly social. Emancipation, then, is realized in a social form 
where transhistorical labor has openly emerged as the regulating principle of society, this notion, of course, is bound to that of socialist revolution as the self-realization of the proletariat. A close reading of Marx's mature critique of political economy, however, calls into question the transhistorical presuppositions of the traditional interpretation. In the Grundrisse, Marx indicates that his fundamental categories should not be understood in narrow economic terms, but as forms of social being that are at once objective and subjective. Moreover, and this is crucial, those categories are not transhistorical, but historically specific to modern or capitalist society. Even categories such as money and labor that appear transhistorical because of their abstract and general character are valid in their abstract generality only for capitalist society, according to Marx. This includes the category of value. In the Grundrisse, Marx explicitly distinguishes value as a form of wealth historically specific to capitalism that is constituted only by human labor time expenditure from material wealth, which is measured by the output of goods and is a function of a variety of natural and social factors, including knowledge. Value underlies a system of production, capitalism, that generates the historical possibility that value itself could be abolished and that production could be organized on a new basis, one not dependent on the expenditure of direct human labor time in production. At the same time, however, value remains the necessary condition of capitalism. This contradiction between the potential generated by the system based on value and its actuality indicates that for Marx, the abolition of capitalism entails the abolition of value and value creating labor, far from signifying the self-realization of the proletariat, the abolition of capitalism would entail the abolition of the proletariat. Volume one of Capital is the rigorous elaboration of this analysis. In Capital, the core social form, the commodity, is both the objectification of labor as we commonly understand it, mediating humans and nature, and the objectification of labor acting in a historically unique manner as a socially mediating activity. That is, if I can have recourse to another theorist, the commodity form is the historically specific simultaneity of labor and interaction. This social form is the most basic determination of a historically new form of social relations that have a peculiar quasi-objective character and are dualistic. They're characterized by the opposition of an abstract general homogeneous dimension and a concrete particular dimension, both of which appear to be natural. This duality of the commodity form is unstable. It generates a dialectical interaction of value and use value that gives rise to a very complex and I would say non-linear historical dynamic that marks capitalist modernity. On the one hand, this dynamic is characterized by ongoing transformations of production and more generally of social life. On the other hand, this historical dynamic entails the ongoing reconstitution of its own fundamental condition as an unchanging feature of social life, namely that value is reconstituted and hence that social mediation ultimately remains affected by labor and that living labor remains integral to the process of production regardless of the level of productivity. Far from being linear, the historical dynamic of capitalism ceaselessly generates what is new while regenerating what is the same. It both generates the possibility of another organization of labor and of social life, and yet hinders that possibility 
from being realized. This historical dynamic is rooted in a fundamentally temporal form of domination. Marx's analysis of socially, of socially necessary labor time is constitutive of, as constitutive of value delineates a socially general abstract norm to which production must conform. It is the first determination of the historically specific abstract form of social domination intrinsic to capitalism. It is the domination of people by time. By a historically specific form of temporality, abstract Newtonian time, which is constituted historically with the commodity form. It would, however, be one-sided to view temporality in capitalism only in terms of Newtonian time, that is, as empty homogeneous time. In Marx's analysis, once capitalism is fully developed, Ongoing increases in productivity redetermine the unit of abstract time. They push it forward, as it were. The movement delineated is the movement of time. Hence, it cannot be apprehended within the frame of Newtonian time, but requires a superordinate frame of reference within which the frame of Newtonian time moves. This movement of time can be termed historical time. The redetermination of the abstract constant time unit redetermines the compulsion associated with that unit. In this way, the movement of time acquires a necessary dimension. Abstract time and historical time then are dialectically interrelated both are constituted historically with the commodity and capital forms as structures of domination. Now this is the opposite of the structuralist assumption that social logic is synchronous. Here the only logic is what the structuralists call diachrony. Only the historical development is logical. The dynamic which is why Marx is not giving a snapshot of capitalist society. He does not try to give a social picture of capitalist society. He's giving an analysis of its dynamic. The dynamic generated by the dialectic of these temporalities is grasped by the category of capital, which Marx initially introduces as self-valorizing value. Capital for Marx, then, is a category of movement. It is value in motion. It has no fixed form, no fixed material embodiment, but appears in different moments of its spiraling path in the form of money and commodities, which is why he splits them off earlier in volume one. It's significant that as Marx unfolds this category, its relationship to the immediate producers changes. With what Marx calls the real subsumption of labor, and the increasing importance of science and technology in production, capital becomes less and less the mystified form of powers that actually are those of the workers. Rather, the socially productive powers appropriated by capital increasingly become socially general productive powers that no longer can be understood as those of the immediate producers. The condition for the emergence historically of this general knowledge and power is that they are constituted historically in alienated form. This accumulation of socially general knowledge renders value and hence proletarian labor increasingly anachronistic at the same time the dialectic of value and use value reconstitutes value and the necessity of such labor. As an aside, it should be noted that by grounding the contradictory character of the social formation in the dualistic forms expressed by the categories of commodity and capital, Marx implies that structurally based social contradiction is specific to capitalism. The notion that reality, 
or social relations in general are essentially contradictory and dialectical appears in light of this analysis to be one that can only be assumed metaphysically, not explained. One, exp one implication of this analysis is that capital does not exist as a unitary totality, and that Marx's notion of the dialectical contradiction of forces and relations of production is intrinsic to capital, not between capital and something else. It's a function of its two dimensions. As a contradictory totality, capital is generative of the complex historical dynamic I began to outline, a dynamic that points to the possibility of its own overcoming. This understanding of capitalism's complex dynamic allows for a critical social rather than technological analysis of the trajectory of growth and the structure of production in modern society. Marx's key concept of surplus value not only indicates, as traditional interpretation would have it, that the surplus is produced by the working class, but as a temporal form of wealth, it, is, it shows that capitalism is characterized by a determinate runaway form of growth. The problem of economic growth and capitalism within this framework is not only that it is crisis-ridden, as has frequently been emphasized, but the form of growth itself, one entailing the accelerating destruction of the natural environment, is problematic. The trajectory of growth would be different, according to this approach, if the ultimate goal of production were increased quantities of material wealth rather than surplus value. This approach also provides the basis for a critical analysis of the structure of social labor and the nature of production and capitalism. It indicates that industrial production should not be grasped as a technical process that, although increasingly socialized, is used by private capitalists for their own ends. Rather, the approach I'm outlining grasps the process itself as intrinsically capitalist. Capital's drive for ongoing increases in productivity gives rise to a productive apparatus of considerable technological sophistication that renders the production of material wealth essentially independent of direct human labor time expenditure, and this opens the possibility of socially general reductions in labor time and fundamental changes in the nature and social organization of labor, yet these possibilities are not realized in capitalism. Instead, value, which is constituted by direct human labor time expenditure, is reconstituted as the foundation of the system, even as it becomes anachronistic in terms of the material wealth capacities of the system. Consequently, although there is a growing shift away from manual labor, the development of technologically sophisticated production does not liberate people from fragmented and repetitive labor as post-industrial theory would like it to happen. Similarly, labor time is not reduced on a socially general level, but is distributed unequally, even increasing for many. On the one hand, the species capacities constituted historically in the form of capital open up the historical possibility of a future, a form of social production that no longer is based on the expenditure of direct human labor and production, that is, on the labor of a class. On the other hand, the necessity of the present is constantly reconstituted. This approach treats the working class as a basic element of capitalism, rather than as the embodiment of its negation. And it implicitly conceptualizes socialism not in terms of the realization of labor and of industrial production, but in terms of the possible abolition of the proletariat and of the organization of production based on proletarian labor, as well as the, of the dynamic system of abstract compulsion constituted by labor as a socially mediating activity. By reconceptualizing post-capitalist society, in terms of the overcoming of the proletariat and the labor it does,
that is, in terms of a transformation of the general structure of labor and time, this approach differs both from the traditional Marxist notion of the realization of the proletariat and from the capitalist mode of abolishing working classes by creating an underclass within the framework of the unequal distribution of labor and time nationally and globally. The possibility of the future, one in which surplus production no longer must be based on the labor of an oppressed class, is at the same time the possibility of a disastrous development, one in which the growing superfluity of labor is expressed as the growing superfluity of people. By shifting the focus of the critique away from an exclusive concern with the market and private property, this approach could provide the basis for a critical theory of so-called actually existing socialist countries as alternative and failed forms of capital accumulation, rather than as social modes that represented the historical negation of capital in however imperfect a form. I haven't had time to elaborate the notion that the category should be interpreted not merely as economic, but to use Marxist terms as Daseinsformen, Existenzbestimmungen, which indicates that they are also to be understood as cultural categories entailing determinate views of the world and concepts of personhood, for example. I disagree that the critique of political economy should be understood as a critical political economy based on the notion of interests. Um, and that only a focus on social actors directly can be normative. This misunderstands, as far as I'm concerned, that the categories, this misunderstands the categories as being that of a structural functionalist approach. The notion of the fetish, as I think was indicated very nicely by Wendy Brown in her talk yesterday, indicates that the forms of commodity and capital are also cultural forms, which allows one to understand historically forms of thought and normativity within which social actors operate. I'd like to suggest that by relating the overcoming of capital to the overcoming of proletarian labor, this interpretation could begin to approach the historical emergence of post-proletarian self-understandings and subjectivities. It opens the possibilities for a theory that can reflect historically on the new social movements of recent decades and the sorts of historically constituted worldviews they embody and express. It might also be able to approach the global rise of forms of fundamentalisms as populist fetishized forms of opposition to the differential effects of neoliberal global capitalism. It's become evident, considered retrospectively, that the social, political, economic, cultural configuration of capitalist hegemony has varied historically. From mercantilism through 19th century liberal capitalism, 20th century state-centric capitalism, to contemporary neoliberal global capitalism. Each configuration has elicited a number of penetrating critiques of exploitation and uneven, inequitable growth, for example, or of technocratic, bureaucratic modes of domination. Each of these critiques, however, is incomplete. As we now see, capital cannot be identified fully with any of its historical configurations, which is why I've been trying to operate on an extremely abstract level. I've sought to differentiate between approaches that, however sophisticated, ultimately are critiques of one configuration of capital and an approach that allows for an understanding of capital as the core of the social formation, separable from its various surface configurations. The distinction between capital as the core of the social formation and historically specific configurations of capitalism has become increasingly important. Conflating the two has resulted in significant misrecognitions. Recall Marx's assertion 
that the coming social revolution must draw its poetry from the future, unlike earlier revolutions that focused on the past, misrecognized their own historical context. In that light, traditional Marxism backed into a future it did not grasp. Rather than pointing to the overcoming of capital, it entailed a misrecognition that focusing on private ownership and the market conflated capital and its 19th century configuration. Consequently, it implicitly affirmed the new state-centric configuration that emerged out of the crisis of liberal capitalism. The unintended affirmation of a new configuration of capitalism can be seen more recently, I think, in the anti-Hegelian turn to Nietzsche characteristic of much post-structuralist thought beginning in the early 1970s. Such thought, arguably, has also backed into a future it did not adequately grasp. In rejecting the sort of state-centric order traditional Marxism implicitly affirmed, it did so in a manner that was not capable of critically grasping the neoliberal global order that has superseded state-centric capitalism, East and West. The historical transformations of the past century, then, have not only revealed the weaknesses of much traditional Marxism, as well as various forms of post-Marxism, but also suggest the central significance of a critique of capitalism for an adequate critical theory today. By attempting to rethink Marx's conception of capital as the essential core of the social formation, I sought to contribute to the reconstitution of a robust critique of capitalism today that freed from the conceptual shackles of approaches that identify capitalism with one of its historical configurations could potentially be adequate to our social universe. Thank you.